A fascinating online lecture with an archaeology professor recently included a suggestion that Stone Age people turn their eyes skyward after comet impacts and near misses. The claim was made by Professor Tim Darville of Bournemouth University during a presentation that was streamed online recently. Professor Darville has recently been involved in an intellectual and historical debate with other researchers over his controversial suggestion that Stonehenge was an ancient calendar, and he expanded on that and discussed why such a device would be so important to Stone Age people. During a Q&A session in the entertaining and informative session, Professor Darville was asked a range of questions on the location of Stonehenge and his idea that the monument was used for marking and measuring the passage of time. On the former, he said, many of our ceremonial sites, Avebury, Stonehenge, Dorchester and all these sorts of places, have been built on areas that were relatively clear of forests. They were big, natural, open areas long before they got used for these structures, so it may be that nature was guiding people to use these sites in these particular ways. That's where they built their first monuments and, once they were there, they carried on and, in a way, the stone structures are there because the earth structures were there and why the earth structures were there becomes the next question down the road. And on his calendar hypothesis, he said, the positions of the solar axes are pretty much as they are now back in the Neolithic. There have been some swings about over the years, but broadly speaking, we're within fractions of degrees. That's not the case with the stars, of course. The stars would go through a much different set of processes, which we know as precession, and many of the stars which were visible to Neolithic people are no longer visible to us in the Northern Hemisphere in the same way, so we have to be careful. But the Sun, and the Moon as well, are pretty much in the right places now. What perhaps becomes important is whether they could have observed some of these things was the weather. Those who are regular attenders of the summer or winter solstices at Stonehenge will know that it is a little hit and miss. There have been some rather good summer sunrises in the last few years, but I don't think there has been a very clear winter sunset visible for at least the last few years anyway. That's not to say it won't happen next year of course, but it is quite difficult to see sometimes because of the weather. So what we don't know a lot about, and which would be nice to know more, is what in fact the weather was like in the middle part of the 3rd millennium BC. And that's something I've no doubt weather scientists are looking at, and there is a certain amount of information, but we need better information about what sorts of observational possibilities, or whether it was such a bad period for the weather that it was difficult. I rather suspect, though, that it was a period when things were quite visible, and we might just ask ourselves the rhetorical question of what triggered this interest in solar cults. It's something that occurs first in the eastern Mediterranean, then across the rest of the Mediterranean, and then gets picked up in these beaker cultures, and then moved on into some of the things I was showing you here in the British Isles. Something was triggering that, and Mike Bailey has written a certain amount about this. You may have seen his book, Exodus to Arthur, which explores the possibility, for example, that there were close comet hits or passes that the Earth experienced around the middle part and the early part of the 3rd millennium BC, and that's a possibility. I think we've got to look at and marry together some of the evidence which is accumulated in other sciences about weather patterns, about climate patterns, about comet hits, all these kinds of things. We need to put all this stuff together to form a picture of the environment that these people living in central southern Britain in the 3rd millennium BC must have experienced. We tend to focus on the archaeology, but, of course, their daily lives are influenced by all these other things as well. And that's the thing about archaeology. It has its tentacles out into so many other subjects because they're all relevant to how people live their lives. He added, Calendars are all about structure, these relationships between the deities and the everyday person working the land, living out their lives in Wiltshire, or wherever it was they came to Stonehenge from. So the calendar is a way of making sure that those offerings are made at the right time, that the god is propitiated at the right moment. If you look at the early Greek calendars, for example, a lot of them are about working out when Apollo is at Delphi, because there's no point going to Delphi for a reading or a healing if Apollo is not there, and in the stories of Apollo, Apollo was only at Delphi for nine months of the year, three months of the year he was somewhere else. End quote. According to Herodotus, Apollo would venture out of Hellas and travel to the mysterious northern land known as Hyperborea during this time. In closing his lecture, Professor Darville made a plea for a new approach in archaeology and said that those who study the past should concentrate on reading the evidence and looking at what is actually there. He said that by doing that I think we can make some useful advances. It's not all about having a big theory and trying to prove it, he added. He said this would involve a switch from a deductive approach to an inductive one. 
A link to view a replay of Professor Darville's lecture is in the description below. For now, that's it for this video. Don't forget to like, share, and most importantly, subscribe. And you can also support the channel on Subscribestar via the link in the description. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.